Good evening or good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you are here in the U.S. Uh, or around the world, for that matter. Uh, my name is Bob Christensen, and I am the moderator for today's uh, webinar. And I would like to uh, thank very much Dr. Glenn Pfeffer for joining us today. He is the director of the Foot and Ankle Center at Cedars Sinai Medical Center, and he will be giving our uh, talk today on bracing versus surgery. So before I turn it over to him, I just want to remind you of a couple of things. In the lower right corner of your screen, for those of you on the webinar, you'll see um, an area where you can ask questions. So feel free to um, add questions in as we go through the presentation. And uh, we're going to hold all questions on this webinar until the end. So um, we'll try and get to as many of them as we can uh, at the end of the webinar. So with all that said, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Pfeffer. And, uh, here we go. Dr. Pfeffer? Yes, I'm here. Good. Welcome, everybody. I know there are a few of my patients out there who are listening in and wanted to say hello. Um, most importantly, I want to thank the CMTA for inviting me to do this webinar. Um, it's a remarkable organization, just more incredible as I get to know it even better. Um, it's run by a remarkable group of people, and I'm really honored to be associated with them, and you should all be honored to have them working on your behalf. Um, Patrick Livney, their CEO, who I've got really gotten to know, has an incredible fire in his belly and an infectious commitment to the mission of, of treating and curing Charcot-Marie Tooth um, disease. And that spills over and is part of the, the, uh, the, the sentiment of the entire board. Um, I also want to give just special thanks to Dr. Michael Shai. Um, Michael probably doesn't remember, but we had a phone discussion 10 years ago, and uh, based on that, um, uh, he inspired much of the work that I've been doing on CMT here at Cedars Sinai. <coughs> uh, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Um, I, I work at uh, Cedars Sinai uh, Medical Center in Los Angeles, and I have a lot of different hats. Um, one of the ones that I enjoy the most is working at the CMT um, center that we have here. That's um, uh, a part of the large uh, CMTA um, organization in the United States. Um, as I prepared this talk, why am I not advancing here? There we go. As I prepared this talk, um, I thought of my own role in treating patients with CMT and Somehow my mind went back to when I was a young boy and the words of Neil Armstrong when he first walked on the moon. And I completely understand that my role as a surgeon is, is just small steps um, with my patients. And that the research coordinated by Dr. Shai and the CMTA is, are really the giant leaps that, that we're all here to support. Um, and for that I thank them. Now, people ask me why, oops, let's see what's going on. People ask me, why would that not work? Huh, let's see why this is not going forward the way it should. There, we'll see what goes on in electronics. People ask me why I'm interested in CMT, um, you know, as a surgeon, and it has to do with people like Sarah. Sarah was one of my patients. Uh, when I first met Sarah several years ago, she had one desire which was to walk down the hallway so that she could graduate from high school and not have to be in a wheelchair holding on to someone. Um, this was a video taken by her family um, before uh, um, I saw her, she, uh, and she couldn't walk at all. And after several surgeries on her feet and uh, a lot of tremendous commitment on the part of Sarah and her family, um, this was the video um, shortly after I discharged her, um, I actually got a, a call from her about six months ago, and she was walking around London, she said, in pretty cute shoes, and she wanted to thank me. This was a picture that she sent me shortly after her surgery about a shoe party she had. And this was a young woman who'd only been in braces. So uh, that's why, you know, I, I work with patients who have CMT. Um, you might ask why I like to give lectures on CMT or why I want to talk to patients. Well, uh, this video really demonstrates, and some of you may have seen it, but 
I'm always so tickled by it. This video demonstrates the importance of groups talking to each other. You know, doctors communicating with patients, researchers communicating with the CMT, and I just wanted to share it with you briefly. Every time I see it, <laughs> I just can't help but laugh. But how many people out there have felt that way leaving a doctor's office? You know, that you just really haven't communicated well with what's going on or haven't been understood. I, a lot of people know I have my own foot problem, and my mom took me to probably six doctors in New York City growing up, and the condition was just completely undiagnosed. And only about 40 years later did I actually make the diagnosis myself. So let's go back to 1886. Charcot and Marie, they actually um, first documented this condition, but they were really wrong about the etiology, at least as I understand it. They thought that this CMT was an intrinsic problem to the muscles, um, perhaps uh, a myelopathy. It was actually Tooth in England who postulated at the same time that CMT was a condition uh, of the nerves. Um, let's fast forward 100 years. Um, I was first going into practice. I believe um, it was a year later that the CMTA would, went under a different name at the time had their second major research consortium that went on at Columbia that really mapped out a lot of the research that's being done even today. There was very little, if any, genetic testing at the time and certainly not much known about, as much known about CMT. Um, I had my first patient. Uh, she came to the office. I had no idea what she had. This wasn't covered in medical school. It wasn't something that was um, dealt with in orthopedic residency. She took her shoes off reluctantly and told me that no one had ever seen her feet before. And really, since then, I was committed to learning more about this as much as I could and helping people as much as I could. Um, her feet were twisted. She couldn't walk. They were even worse than Sarah's. Um, but she went on to be able to walk and, as she put it, have her first dates and ultimately get married. Um, I'm not going to talk about the, 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 you know, the spectrum of CMT. We know it's a large umbrella. There are multiple categories and subcategories, and there's sort of brilliant research going on organized by the CMTA throughout the United States uh, on these conditions. Um, it's important, as I know you all do, to understand what this condition is, and perhaps mo and importantly, um, and uh, often clinically under the radar, to know that there are certain medications that um, are, are, can, can aggravate a, or bring out a, a CMT condition. And again, I'm not going to dwell on that, but it is something that, that I always um, want to mention because I see patients who said they had no clinical presentation of CMT until they ended up taking one of these or several other medications. And that's something, of course, to discuss with your neurologist. Um, there are varied symptoms and varied clinical presentation. Um, some people uh, will present with a flat foot. Some people will have more advanced paralysis. Others will have a very high arched foot. But we're going to just concentrate on the, the foot problems here um, that people have. Um, now, Often, this can just be a subtle high arched foot. Perhaps there's just a little bit of weakness that's occurring um, at the outset. Someone wrote a question in, could I really be getting CMT symptoms at the age of 70? Um, and again, I'm not a neurologist, but I think the answer to that is it, it's certainly possible. Um, most people, however, are getting this uh, in adolescence. And it often, as you all know, goes undiagnosed um, for a long time. Um, people aren't as good in sports. They're, they're not able to quite keep up. Um, perhaps they have trouble running around the bases. Um, they feel imbalanced, and nobody knows why. Um, I can tell you personally, I, I was a, a great soccer goalie 
<laughs> to my right. But because I had problems with my left foot that weren't diagnosed, I really wasn't very good at all going to my left. But I never understood why. And I was often balled out by my soccer coach for not being better going to my left. And I think perhaps that inspired a lot of my um, personal interest in, in conditions like CMT and CMT in particular. Okay. What can you have? There's weakness, atrophy. Um, deformity of the foot, that typical high arch, a drop foot. We talked about that. Some people have just paralysis that develops. There can be sensory loss, and there can be chronic pain. Um, and the pain is a very interesting issue that, that I'm going to deal with a little bit more as I go along. It can definitely be neuropathic pain, but the pain can also have to do with just the simple foot deformity itself, which often that link often goes unrecognized. The hands can be involved. People, of course, can rarely but sometimes have problems with breathing and weakness. Um, the condition can run in families. This is a group of people from up north in Eureka, and all of the siblings were involved with, with some form or another of CMT. Okay. Now, I really want to so say, we're going to really just sort of make this very simple um, because it, it is reasonably simple. I mean, you know, we're, we're surgeons and I'm a surgeon, not a neurologist. The smartest guys always went into neurology, I think, and medicine. So for the orthopedic surgeons, we sort of lump things together. And let's try to do that, although I completely understand that, that CMT has a very varied presentation of the foot and ankle. All right. Now, this is fairly typical of the muscle imbalance that happens with CMT. Um, and these terms I don't want you to get held up on. But basically, one of the big muscles on the outside of the leg, if you reach down and touch the outside of your leg on your calf, that's where the peroneus brevis is. And that typically gets weak early on in CMT. And that happens while the mu large muscle, the posterior tibial tendon on the inside of the leg, stays strong. The posterior tibial tendon is the, is the major muscle and tendon that holds up the foot. I often equate it to patients as a cable holding up the Golden Gate Bridge. Now, on a, in a separate condition, if you have a problem with the posterior tibial tendon, the foot can start to go flat. But in this case, it's the weakness of the peroneus brevis and the persistent strength of the posterior tibial tendon that causes the heel to turn inward. That's what we call hind foot varus. The heel is turning inward. Now, if somebody's developing a paralytic or a more globally paralytic presentation of CMT, the foot can be flat and flaccid. But the most typical is what I'm showing here. Although actually, there's actually no good data in the literature to really support the percentages of each of these problems. But I know this is what we tend to see mostly. And there's the foot. See that interned heel? Let's just look at the back. That's caused because of a very strong posterior tibial tendon, and there it is that I just drew out, and a weak peroneus brevis. Right? If we went along to a normal person and just clipped the peroneus brevis muscle or cut it, or for some reason it became paralyzed, this is the type of back of the foot that would occur. Now let's look at the front of the foot and see what's happening. Here's another view of the back of the foot with those interned heels. And here's another view, a young woman from Europe. You can see those, those heels are interned is an incredibly unbalanced foot and a very, very difficult to foot to walk on. Now, this doesn't happen overnight. And often the changes are very subtle in the beginning, I think, as many of you know. And you're starting to get an unbalanced gait, and you're starting to not feel um, that you can run as well, or perhaps you're tripping more. Well, it's no wonder, because years can go by, as I said before, this diagnosis is correctly made. Okay. Now, let's talk about the front of the foot. Can I go back here? Let's see if it goes back. There. Take a look at the front of the foot on these patients. See the front? Okay. Now, what's causing that? It's really very simple again. There's a weak tibialis anterior and a strong perineus longus. So you're saying, well, what are those things? Well, the, weak tib the tibialis anterior is the muscle right in the front of your leg that lifts up your ankle. 
Um, many of you may not be able to lift up your ankle, but if you can, your tibialis anterior is what's doing it. And the perineus longus is on the outside of the leg, and it goes down to the bottom of the foot. And when you have this weak tibialis anterior and this persistently strong perineus longus, you get a deformity of the front of the foot. And this is just what's happening in CMT patients. It, it happens because of the way that the muscles are innervated and the way that the disease presents. And this is true across many different types of CMT. So there's the front of the foot, and that's what we call forefoot valgus. That's just the way we talk about it. And the main thing is the big toe and that bone is down. And that's because this muscle, that, rep, that arrow is supposed to represent the tibialis anterior that lifts up the ankle, right? That's getting weak. That's why I made it a small arrow. And the perineus longus, that comes around the leg on the outside, and it's an inserts right on the bottom at the base of that big toe in the midfoot, and that stays strong, and that causes a deformity. If, again, you took a scissor and you cut a normal person's tibialis anterior, this is what would happen after a while. You would get this type of deformity. Now, that is a difficult problem because the heel's interned and the front of the foot is down. Here's an extreme example. But somebody is just hit from every angle with this. The heel is interned, and you step up, and you feel unstable, and you start to topple a little to the outside. And then the brain tries to balance this out and land us on the front of the foot, which is also crooked. Now, at the same time, perhaps actually before all these changes occur, the little muscles in the foot, they're called intrinsic muscles because they're intrinsic to the foot, start to become affected. First they're weaker, then they don't coordinate as well, and then they become paralyzed. You see the toes here, how they're cocked up? One of the main reasons for that is loss of those little intrinsic muscles in the foot. Now, th these are impossible feet to walk on, right? Um, they're hard because a person has a neuropathy and doesn't have great feeling. They're hard because there is paralysis or motor weakness, and it's hard to get through the gait cycle. But they're just hard also because they're crooked. Take, oh, oh let's see here, yeah. This is an extreme example of a, a foot that, that's just gone on too long like this. This is a boy in India. And you know, I was so proud of the CMTA. They actually recently just helped support um, through a surgeon that I was able to connect them with, um, the surgical correction of these feet that was just recently done, just a, a few weeks ago. And that was such a wonderful thing for the CMTA to do for this young man. Now, here's a three-dimensional CAT scan of the foot. You can see the really high arch, right? And you can see the imbalance. Look at the forefoot there, how it's tilted around. And it shows you how difficult it, a foot that is. Um, okay, now let's see what's next. Because of the deformity that's occurring, the imbalance that's occurring, <clears throat> someone ends up walking on two or maybe three spots. They end up walking where this arrow is predominantly on the side of their foot, their heel, and then sometimes, as we show here, I don't know if you, can you see that arrow? I guess you can, I think you can see it probably, maybe not. But, but they end up walking on, on these three areas, the two in the front of the foot and one in the heel. And that becomes very, very painful. Here's another one. Very painful problems. Here's another. Give the, these feet to a person who has no problem and ask them to walk a block they couldn't even walk a foot. It happens slowly in someone with CMT. So you learn to make do as best you can and get used to it. But it, it's, it's, um, it, it's a challenge. We all know that's a challenge. Because we're walking crooked, or a person's walking on the side of their foot, there's huge stress placed on the side of the foot. And that can cause stress fractures, as shown by this arrow. That's on the outside of the middle of the foot. That bone has just taken too much pounding, and it went on to break. Look at the ankle here. This is a straight view of the ankle. And because the back of the foot is so crooked, the ankle just starts to give out and become lax. Almost every day I'm in clinic, I'll see some athlete 
who sprained his ankle, her ankle, and has a loose ankle like this, they can't deal with it. They say they're tripping, they're, they're giving out, they can't trust their ankle, they can't do any walking or running without pain in their ankle. So that's just one possible component of the person with all of these issues with the CM, with the CMT deformity or the CMT, you know, malalignment of the foot. All right. Now, one day, I'm not sure I'm going to be necessary anymore. But let me go further. One day, I won't be necessary anymore. Because with the efforts of, you know, Dr. Shai, the board of CMTA, um, the CMTA, and other groups, um, there'll be a cure for this disease. But until that happens, patients walk into my office, or as best they can walk into my office, and they want help. They want to be able to lead a life. I saw a young fellow a week ago. Um, I was able to get him scheduled for surgery next week, and his feet are so bad, all he can do is crawl around his house. He's 17 years old. He's dropped out of school. Um, so for now, until we cure this, there are many things that I can do to help. And what we're going to do now is talk about the role of surgery and whether it's right for everybody and the role of bracing and whether it's right for everyone. Now, please keep in mind, I'm giving this talk to you guys from a surgical point of view. Um, and you'll have other discussions from a bracing point of view. I know the CMTA just came out with a very nice online information, uh, online information about bracing. But let's go through this, and I'll give you my opinion. This is controversial, but this is how I deal with people with um, CMTA, CMT problems. So you see a doctor. You're going to get hit with all sorts of different recommendations. And that's because there's no good literature on this, and there's no exact answer on what to do. Should you go to therapy? Should you have a brace? How about a simple orthotic? What about a different shoe? Should you have surgery to fuse the joints together to give you a stable foot? A tendon transfer to balance out the foot? A bone cut? Or maybe just leave well enough alone? You're not walking that well, but better than wearing a brace or risking surgery. And patients are confused. And this is the type of look that I'll get. What am I supposed to do? This is just driving me, driving me crazy. I don't know. I've seen multiple doctors. Everybody's telling me something different. Why does that happen? Well, it happens in life in general, right? Every time you go to somebody who specializes in something, they tend to understand their own agenda best. And we'll talk about that. Now, what this slide really is about is that big problems start small. So you, whatever you do, you don't want to let your foot and ankle problem progress and progress and get more deformed or weaker until you're not walking on a flat foot or until you become so deconditioned that there's no option but a wheelchair. Sometimes a wheelchair is what has to be, but in many patients that can be avoided. Physical therapy is key. And it's really not been on the radar screen for a long time. The CMTA is doing really good work on this. But remember that fire. Big problems start small. <clears throat> as early as you can get a diagnosis for this condition, if you have a child or in yourself, you want to do a few key things. And this is just logical. I don't need a study to show me that this is, makes sense. You want to keep your muscles as strong as possible. right? And that can be done. A muscle is a muscle. Yes, in advanced disease, if the muscle's not innervated, there's nothing you can do. But many people uh, represent the wide spectrum of not just having no muscle function. They start with weak muscles, and they can get weaker. But if you can find a therapist who understands what CMT is doing, and the weakness of the peroneus brevis, the weakness of the tibialis anterior, and focus on those muscles, those specific muscles and other muscles that are weak or getting weaker, you will do wonders for yourself. I know patients with CMT, they come in robustly walking, 
Um, yes, they don't have severe disease, but also they're, they're, they've managed to stay very athletic, at least as best they can. They're working out, they're working with a therapist. Now, one of the problems that happens when you have an unbalanced joint, right, is it gets a contracture. Take your hand, make a fist, put your hand in your pocket, and leave it there for six weeks. Then take your hand out, and I'm joking, of course, but then take your hand out and try to move it. You won't be able to because the joints have gotten stiff. Now, here's the data. Move a joint through a range of motion once a day, and you won't get a contracture. The people that are ending up with their Achilles contracted and the posterior tibial contracted and the hind foot inverted didn't start out there. Those are little problems that became big problems. Now, the issue with physical therapy is not everybody knows. And again, I think the CMTA is doing wonderful work, wonderful, on, 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 on disseminating this information on therapists to understand this and want to treat patients. So this, this honestly could be the most important slide that I have uh, uh, on this entire talk. Okay. Any age, start to stretch. I hope a couple of people are giggling. But it's never too late to start physical therapy and a stretch program, if, you know, as, as it's possible. Okay. Now, what is the role of bracing? What's the role of surgery, if any? These are questions my patient asks. Will I get weaker in a brace? Um, how do I know which brace is best? There, there are a million out there. Do I have to wear a brace after surgery? Will I get weaker after surgery? Should I have surgery now or should I wait? Who should do my surgery? Well, these are my recommendations. First of all, when you're a hammer, the world looks like nails. So surgeons like to operate and brace makers like to make braces. It's just the way it is. So you have to try to get a wide spectrum. That's why so many of the CMTA recognized clinics, or I think they call them clinics of excellence, um, I'm sorry, I don't know the exact term, in the United States are multidisciplinary clinics. We have CMT researchers, geneticists, therapists, surgeons, physical therapists, orthodists, all in our clinic. It's a remarkable experience for someone of CMT <coughs> to get eight coordinated opinions all within the few hours that you're there. And of course, there are others like that. I really think, um, to, to my knowledge, really Dr. Shai set the role model for that <coughs> in the country. So I looked up braces and here they are. Uh, I have no idea how to sort this out. Um, the things I could say about, you know, if, especially if I were a naive patient, um, the braces that tend to come up a lot are the Allard brace, uh, the Helios brace, um, what we know is the noodle, and the fat braces. These are, these are the most common braces um, that people are using. I'm sorry if there are a few I've left out, and there's certainly many others and many new ones coming out. Uh, the, the key, let me just see what this next slide, the key is this. The, nobody would buy, in my opinion, that the dress that says one size fits all is one size fits nobody. So a really good brace shop in your area, hopefully, will have multiple braces that you can try as best possible. It's unlikely that someone with a CMT is going to be able to use an off-the-shelf brace, but you can use an off-the-shelf brace of different types to see which is best for you. I think it's really unlikely that an orthotist is going to look at your foot and say, I know for sure this is the brace that you need, at least in my opinion. So try to seek out a brace company or an orthotist company that offers you multiple different braces that you can try on. Now, how about surgery? There's no uniform approach. It's actually remarkable to me. I see patients from all over the country, and they're having different recommendations, which in my opinion don't make much sense, from um, different practitioners. And there's a lot of work that's needed in this, and, and, and I think that's actually going to be coming in the near future, um, a, 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 a summit of, of surgeons, perhaps in the world, to discuss a more uniform approach and would certainly help patients understand this better, right? Okay, now let's go through the specific issues. If you have a foot drop, right, that tibialis anterior is there and you have weak muscles, there's a problem. And what, what you need to do for that, we're going to talk about. Now look at this person. Can you see the tibialis anterior? Oh, it didn't go show quite right. Let me just try that one more time here. 
let me just try it again. Somehow when that video goes through a second time, it shows, but you can look at the toes lifting up. What's lifting up that foot is the tibialis anterior back at the ankle. There it is. See the tibialis anterior? That's the muscle. You can just see the bulge of it lifting up the ankle. And then the toe extensors, all the toes are lifting up the ankle. This is a normal foot. But what happens here is in this patient when that tibialis anterior weakens, the toes have to work harder. And you also get this sort of slap down gait. Now this is only moderate. This is not severe. She still has a little function in her tibialis anterior left. But you can see the halting gait. Now what happens is as the toe extensors, the, the, one, the ones coming from the leg, work harder, you start to get a deformity in the toes. Especially if you remember that those little muscles in the foot are not working well to stabilize the toes. So here's somebody who has a foot drop. And look, do you see how, what they have to do to bring up their ankle? They're really using those toe extensors. And over time, that causes a deformity. We all use our toe extensors to lift our ankle, but not the same degree. And you ultimately end up with a problem like this, which is certainly an impossible one. Even if this is the only problem someone has, that's a really hard problem for a 16-year-old that wants to go to the prom or for someone like me who wants to put on a regular shoe or anybody. So now simple stretching of the toes in the opposite direction of these deformities, straightening out the tip of the toe and bending down the joint where it's cocked up can help prevent this problem over time. And here's another person. And these are people that really need to have an operation or use very orthopedic type shoes. Now, this is a red flag. If anyone doesn't want to see a slightly surgical problem, it is a surgery, close your eyes and I'll tell you when to open them again. Right? But it's just it's for those that are interested, I'm just going to show you the surgery we do for a drop foot. What options do you have for a drop foot when the tibialis anterior is weak? One, this is, you can fuse your ankle. All right, that's, that's possible. And two, here's the surgical picture. You could actually transfer a tendon. Remember that posterior tibial that was so strong and usually remains strong? You can transfer that right to the front of the ankle, and you can get your ankles working again. Or you can use a brace. Okay, surgical people, you can open your eyes again. And this is just a typical type of brace. Now, how do you decide for a drop foot whether you're going to use a brace or have surgery? Well, here's a fellow who had an ankle fusion. Would you know that? Why not? Anyone who has a drop foot might want to have an ankle fusion, but I do not recommend that. And the reason I don't recommend it is although this fellow is walking beautifully after an ankle fusion, he does not have CMT. And all the other muscles in his foot and ankle are working perfectly. Um, here's a person who has one of the braces available. That's the gal who had that drop foot before. But she has a robust walk. Uh, when you have her pants down, when her pants are down, you can barely tell that she has braces like that. She has a spring in her gait. And in my opinion, if you could wear a brace, um, do that and don't have an ankle fusion for a drop foot. The braces are so good now that I would not recommend an ankle fusion. And if a surgeon says, at least in my opinion, look, we do ankle fusions for ankle arthritis all the time. Just remind yourself that those ankle fusions are not being put in for people with weak other muscles. Um, some would disagree with me, but that's, that's my opinion. And when a surgeon tells you not to have surgery, I suppose it's, it's advice worth listening to. Now, what if you just have weak muscles? The foot, so, oh, I'm sorry, in this case. So what my summary is, if you have really weak muscles in a drop foot, get an ankle brace. Don't have surgery on the ankle. Now, what if you have some strong muscles and your foot's dropping down, but some of the muscles in the back of the ankle are working. So let's see here. Here's an example. How about this person with CMT? There's the posterior tibial tendon. It's really working well. It's working too well, isn't it? And it's deforming the foot inward. And oh, why didn't that show? The perineus brevis is on the outside, and, and that's gotten weak. So you can transfer this. This is a tendon that's very strong. Here it is on the inside, the posterior tibial tendon. And we can transfer that right up to the front of the ankle. And that person will no longer have a foot drop. Uh, at least it won't be as bad. And they can avoid a brace. We do surgery like this as an outpatient. We numb up the leg. Um, even in someone with CMT with a neuropathy, our team is expert at giving blocks. And it's not been a problem for us in you know, hundreds of cases. Um, people have no pain usually. I would say 80% of CMT patients 
say they don't really have much surgery pain even after the largest of surgeries. We use these loops to make sure that's the knee there, to make sure we see all the vital structures, and people do very well. Okay, surgery people, close your eyes if you don't want to see this one briefly. Um, it's the red flag. Um, but here's, again, the picture of that tendon transfer. And here's, okay, you can open your eyes now. Here's an example of someone who couldn't walk because both their feet were crooked and dropped down. And this is just after surgery with no therapy. You can see the wounds are still bloody on the left slightly. And that ankle is already starting to move. And they're going to do very well and hopefully avoid a brace. Sometimes you need a brace. If you have an arthritic ankle, an unstable ankle, I'm, forgive me, I misspoke. Sometimes you need to have an ankle fusion. But this is so rare, I can't remember doing an ankle fusion on someone with CMT in the past 10 years. Well, at least in the past five years. Okay. So if you have some strong muscles, surgery is reasonable. You can, and I, I, I would recommend surgery there over a brace. Okay. Remember therapy. If you're in a brace, you can get weaker, and you need to go to a therapist to get a home program. Remember cervical collars for the neck? We stopped using them because they made the neck feel good, but the muscles atrophied. So as long as you're doing a home therapy program, you're going to be fine. And the same is true after surgery. So remember therapy. Now let's talk about the really deformed feet, which is what I tend to see. We saw a picture of this before. It's called a cable varus foot. Um, it's the deformity we discussed. Now you can try orthopedic shoes that are specially made. I, I think that certainly would work. Orthotics are only for minor problems. One of the biggest issues, problems that I see in patients with CMT is they've been tried in multiple pairs of orthotics over many years at great cost. If you have a little pain under the front of your foot, if the heel's a little crooked, if you want some cushioning in a foot that has a too high an arch and is a little stiff, go to an orthotic. But these are not for a long-term benefit. And also bracing. You have to understand that if you have a deformed foot, you can't put it in a brace. Look, this, this case shows everything. This is about a 60-year-old person who's been wearing, whose foot is fixed in that position, down and in, right? We know that position now and why it is. And this is the brace they've been wearing for the past 10 years. And I said, well, why are you wearing that? I mean, doesn't it hurt? You, you, you can't even fit your foot into it. Well, this is what I was told to do, the patient said. So please understand, you need a foot that's flat on the ground to really do well with the brace. My slide, right? The Leaning Tower of Pisa. It's been braced because it's falling over. But ideally, what we'd want for the Leaning Tower of Pisa is to make it like that, right? Straight. And that's what we want to do with the foot. Okay. Here's a foot. You can't really brace that foot. You can try, but who would want to? Patients with CMT have pain, right? They have pain often from neuropathy, and they're on medications for that. Many of you are. Give a foot like this to somebody who doesn't have CMT, and they're going to have pain because it's just such a stiff, painful foot. So very often, and a common problem, the issue that comes up is we'll take someone with a deformed foot like this, straighten it out, and all of a sudden their foot pain goes away because it wasn't so much from the neuropathy as it was from just walking on the foot in such a crooked way. Now you can tell if somebody's resting up for the weekend and not walking at all and you still have pain in the foot, it's probably more neuro neuropathic pain before surgery. But still, it does, even if someone has neuropathic pain, it can't help to be walking around on the foot like that or like this. Pain. It usually is much better after these surgeries. Look at this foot. It's almost 90 degrees to the leg. That that's a, a straight side view of the ankle and a 90 degree view of the foot. Painful. Painful. So what are the goals of surgery to conclude? Well, we want to keep the joints flexible. People with CMT, at least this group we're talking about, often have stiff and rigid foot. We don't want to make them more rigid by fusing them. So we want to preserve motion, get a foot that's flat on the ground. Now, some people after surgery need a brace because they don't have the muscle strength. But still, they can take their foot and put it flat into a brace, which is a blessing. 
Uh, we need to balance the muscle pull. We've talked about the tendons. And I want you to make sure that you see an orthopedic surgeon, an MD who specializes in the foot and ankle. This is not easy surgery, and it needs a lot of experience. Ask your doctor two questions. Are you an orthopedic surgeon, and do you specialize in the foot and ankle, whether you're in England, whether you're in Eastern Europe, whether you're in the United States? Those are the questions. Are you an orthopedic surgeon, and do you specialize in the foot and ankle? And if the answer is yes to both of them, then you've found the right person. Let me show you these slides in conclusion. Here's someone on the bottom who's had their foot operated on. The top hasn't. Here's somebody on the right who's had surgery just recently. You see how swollen the toes are? That's what they started out like on the left. Here's a person whose foot's been operated on the left, and that's what it started out like on the right. He tried to wear a brace for six or seven years. I mean, it's just not possible, not with good function anyway, and not without pain. Here's a young man, his foot's on the left. It's going to be operated on, we just operated on his foot on the right side. No one had ever told me, his mother said, that surgery is a possibility. We just found you online. I think that's a shame. Here's a young man, his foot's been operated on, on the left, right, and here's the one we're about to operate on the left. He came up from Mexico. The right foot on the right's been operated on, the one on the left hasn't yet. Same issue. Right's been operated on, left hasn't. So if you have a foot deformity, a foot that's not flat on the ground, I do not think a brace is helpful and you want to do some type of motion preserving surgery. In my last few slides, um, I just want to show you what we do. There's the perineus, this is the side of the foot. There's the perineus brevis tendon. You can see it there. We transfer it. Uh, oh, forgive me, that's the perineus longus tendon right there. And that's a strong tendon that usually stays strong. So we transfer that into the weak perineus brevis. It prevents then deformity of the front of the foot and gives strength to the ankle. We take a piece of bone. It's very orthopedic. It sounds very creepy <laughs> if you're not used to it, but we do it all the time. We take a piece of bone out of the heel and we move it together and we can put that heel just where we want it. That's how we got those corrections. Now, and in the front of the foot, we can take a small wedge. Remember that big toe that's down? We can take a small wedge out and just bring it together and simply lift it up. This is orthopedic surgery. This is what we do every day in the operating room. So, you know, that's what we end up with. There the bone's been cut. And then take a look at this. Look at this foot. Look at the high arch. This is a side view of someone's foot. Do you see how high that arch is? We've taken a wedge out of the foot. And now look how the arch has come down. Look at the difference between that and that. This person will be much more comfortable and braceable. Um, uh, they may even be able to walk without a brace. And there's a lot of surgery that may be needed, and it's scary. And you don't know what to do, but find somebody you trust, get an opinion, and it will work out well. I would never do this. I think you'd have to be out of your mind to, do, to jump out of a plane. I would be terrified, right? But with good training, good equipment, and a right team approach, people get through. And they do well. And I think you understand my analogy. It's scary. But find the right person, and it'll work out. This young man came to me. He hadn't walked for six years. He was in a wheelchair. His feet were interned. And he was there with his dad. And he said he was scared. And I explained to him why he was, I understood. I said, I understand why you're scared. I did something difficult. I looked him in the eye, and I said, I promise I'll get you better. This is the first time he'd walked in years. And again, you asked me why I like to do it. You know, it's the small smile on his face here, the small step that really makes it all worthwhile for me. So thanks for listening. I think I went a little over, um, but I appreciate your joining me for taking your busy time away. That's it. Uh, Dr. Piper, we have a couple questions here. If we can uh, take a few more minutes, I think we're okay on time. I'm as good as long as you need. Okay, good. Um, the first question is, what is the average uh, recovery time uh, post-op before a patient can walk on the operated foot? Um, the surgery is done as an outpatient. It's done under a block. Um, the pain is really not bad in patients with CMT, possibly because of the neuropathy. It just dulls the pain a bit. Um, they come back at two weeks, the sutures are out, they can't walk for six weeks on one foot, 
and then they can start walking on that foot, but usually in a cast for another two weeks. After eight weeks, they'll start therapy and start walking. Okay. And we have another question about someone who's uh, starting to experience some deformity in their foot, and they want to ask, you know, uh, orthopedic specialist or podiatrist, uh, who should they see? Where, where's the best advice? Yeah, well, that... <laughs> Uh, that's a tough question. You know, it's like giving a webinar and saying, now, who's better, a Republican or a Democrat? <laughs> you know, um, but um, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and I, you want to see an orthopedic surgeon. And, and the reason is, is podiatrists, no matter how well trained, are not allowed to take care of the entire leg. They're, they're limited in almost all states to the foot and ankle and you know some of the structures in the calf muscles that attach to the foot and ankle. So you really need someone who understands your knee, your hip, and your back to get a good sense of this. Um, so that's, that's my best answer for that question. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I would see an orthopedist, as I said before, who specializes in the foot and ankle. Uh, we have another question from a 47-year-old gentleman from the UK who was recently uh, diagnosed with CMT2. And uh, his question is, should he consider the surgery now or uh, only when things go really bad? So I guess it's a general question, you know, at what point do you consider uh, surgery? Yeah, well, the, the most disappointing day I have with a CNT patient is when I say, you know, I can't help you with surgery and unfortunately a brace is not going to be that good for you either, right? We want someone who's going to be really happy in a brace or someone who's going to be really happy with surgery. So if that person who's asking the question is not happy with a brace and they're getting deformity in their foot, it's what I said in my lecture or talk. Go to a therapist who understands this. Do stretching exercises, but don't let a, little, a smaller problem turn into a big one. Every day the deformity gets worse is every day that my job gets harder and harder and harder, and the results can be compromised. Um, you just need to find somebody who's confident and says, I can help you with a brace for sure, or I can help you sh for sure with surgery. There can be complications with surgery, but when I can, I'll look somebody in the eye and I will say, I will make you better. I, of course, you can't promise that surgery will be perfect, but, but that promise that I'm giving is, 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 is you know, on, 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 on all the previous results that we've had. I wouldn't tell it to someone I couldn't help, so you need to find someone like that. Get it done sooner than later if you find the right person. And the CMTA could help hook you up with the right person. And anyone who's on this call can get me through the CMTA, and I'm happy to talk to you online or, you know, through email. Um, we have another question here about uh, someone with a 14-year-old son uh, with CMT and has a pretty severely uh, deformed foot and uh, with bones uh, apparently fused in his ankle, they believe. And the doctor they're seeing is recommending they wait uh, for surgery until he's uh, at least 16 years old um, because of uh, bone plates or growth plates have not yet uh, fully fused or whatever. And yeah. so they're suggesting bracing. So they're looking for advice on if that's correct or what they should do. Yeah, it's an excellent question. And that's actually one of the things Dr. Shah and I had talked about 10 years ago. Um, but a 14-year-old, in terms of the foot, in most cases, is an adult. Most of those physes and growth plates um, have, have reached, that we're dealing with for CMT surgery, have reached their full maturity. Cutting through the heel could be done in a 14-year-old, and it could be done in a much younger person. So I wouldn't want my child to have to wear a brace just because of all the reasons that kids have trouble in general at 14. Why add a brace to it? So the key is whether they can be helped with surgery. And if the problem is the interned heel uh, and the unbalanced foot, um, uh, unequivocal, get it taken care of sooner than later. Okay. Um, we have a question here. Is it, uh, in your experience, is it better to do um, one foot at a time or both feet at once? Yeah, I great answer. question. Um, I'm going to uh, just be a bit sarcastic in my answer in the sense that it's better to do both at the same time, but I certainly would never do it. it, it it's, the, it's the 
it's an impossible task. I mean, theoretically, it'd be great to do both, but I swore off that 20 years ago. You're, someone's just too impaired from the one foot problem. You know, with two feet, you just you couldn't get to the bathroom. You, you couldn't take care of yourself. So what we often do when people come from out of town is we'll overlap it. I don't think what you want to do is one foot, get better for four or five or six months, and then do the other. So we'll do one foot, and as soon as you can start walking on it, we'll do the other. So there, we just operated on a patient. We did one foot. Six weeks later, we did the other foot when they were still in a cast for the first foot. But of course, that person had a lot of support from family, and you know you, you need people to help out. But I, I would, you, there's really no way to do a CMT foot bilaterally without too much risk for me. I'm sure there are people in the country who would do it, but I would not advise it. <clears throat> all right. I think uh, that about answers all the questions. I really want to thank you for your time, and everybody, thank you for your participation in the questions. And of course, if you have any follow-up questions, you can send them to us at the, at the CMTA, and we'll be happy to do what we can to answer those questions. Uh, and with that, I say uh, good night to everybody. Thanks again. Thank Dr. you, everybody. Thank you for joining me.